you know, the NSL was, and Ray Hudson says it in, in the, the film, it, it's like, you know, this is a moment that will never be repeated, you know, can never be repeated. All these world stars coming at once for this sort of almost Harlem Globetrotter-esque type football teams um, with some homegrown talent, with massive crowds, with huge enthusiasm. Yeah, it's, it's a huge thing in football history, even though we mocked it back then as English people. Um, I know speaking to all the football players that played out there at that time, who were top, top players in the English leagues, they preferred their time out there, out in America, because the sun shone, the crowds were great, the enthusiasm was massive, and by comparison, England was, was awful, absolutely awful to play in. Decrepit stadiums, you know, hooliganism all the time, um, you know, teams not being that good, and, and they went to America and sort of almost threw their shackles off and enjoyed it. And that's what attracted George at the beginning, was to be able to, you know, to literally throw off his shackles and enjoy his football again. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hi there, it's Tim Hanlon. How are you? Thanks for joining me here on Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that's devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Today we're focused on the life, the times, and the travails of uh, one of the more uh, prolific and frankly enigmatic players to ever grace uh, the world of professional soccer and his name is George Best. And to today's guest uh, is the uh, director, the producer, the creator of a, uh, a tremendous and absolutely fascinating documentary about the life of uh, George Best. It's called George Best All By Himself. That's the name of the film. And the name of the person that we're going to be talking to behind all of it, his name is Dan Gordon. And um, uh, for those who have not yet seen the film, uh, it is an ESPN Films 30 for 30 presentation. Uh, it debuted uh, at the tail end of uh, July on ESPN. Uh, you will be able to find it. You should be able to find it, depending on when you're listening to this episode, uh, on various ESPN uh, networks. And, uh, of course, it is available now on demand on the Watch ESPN app. Uh, and uh, that means if you are a subscriber to ESPN in some form or fashion uh, and you have a broadband connection, you should have access to Watch ESPN. Uh, and there is where you will find George Best, all by himself, and I, I you know, I, I do talk up a lot of uh, great books and, and and movies and stuff, but I have to tell you that uh, this one, uh, the first five minutes alone of this film, uh, is is a tremendous, uh, jarring and engaging, engrossing uh, uh, a few minutes that will, I guarantee you, not only knock your socks off but draw you in, and that's if you, even if you're not a soccer fan, uh, if you're not a sports fan, uh, you didn't know who George Best was. Um, it, it, the story is, is just, uh, it's hugely impactful. He's a very complex man, uh, a genius on the field, uh, very troubled off the field. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a well done and well-crafted film. And I, and I, I can't suggest, uh, uh, watching it, uh, uh, often enough and soon enough. It's called George Best all by himself. A, the creator, the director of it, Dan Gordon is our guest coming up in a couple of seconds. Uh, before we get there, some housekeeping, um, Thank you uh, again for all your incoming comments. Uh, we love the enthusiasm you have for the show. We love doing it and uh, we love to do more of it. And um, uh, we encourage you please to uh, follow us on social media. That's a great way to keep in contact with us and what we're doing. Uh, of course, on Twitter, that's at Good Seat Still. Uh, in uh, the Instagram world, you will find us at Good Seat Still Available. Uh, you will find a Facebook page devoted to the show as well. Look for that. Uh, And if you forget any of those things, of course, you can go to our website, the sort of hub of all things Forgotten Sports uh, and this show. And that's called uh, the website, of course, is GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Thank you for visiting uh, early and often. And uh, please follow us in all those places. Rate and review us in iTunes or wherever you're allowed to rate and review such shows. All those things add up to uh, more and more good karma and uh, the ability for us to um, to share some of these uh, great stories and remembrances um, uh, in the uh, months and hopefully years to come. So thank you for all of that. Um, that's all I got, I guess, for that. So uh, let's waste no more time. Let us uh, segue immediately to a uh, a, a great conversation uh, with our friend Dan Gordon, uh, extraordinary documentarian. He and uh, the life and times of George Best and he, the creator of George Best all by himself. Coming up now here on The Big Show.
I am really curious uh, as to what even uh, brought you to George Best as a subject to tackle uh, film-wise. Uh, what was the origins of your interest? I mean, I, I guess as a kid, I, I grew up with stories of George. I never saw him play. Um, I'm not a Man United fan either, in fact. But I grew up in Manchester, and if you grow up in Manchester and not a Man United fan, you do go to the other end of the spectrum uh, in terms of hating Man United when when I grew up. And um, But actually, George is someone who crossed the boundary, I think, of, uh, of nearly every fan of every club has an admiration for him, for, for what he did on the pitch, and uh, and to a certain degree, you know, the, the antics that he got up, up to off the pitch. So um, he, he was a fascinating character, but what I felt hadn't been done, there had been documentaries, especially on TV, um, about George. What I hadn't really understood was the depth of darkness that accompanied that rise and fall. Um, he tended to have predominantly, um, you know, eulogising documentaries made about George, but absolutely not um, not anything that, that looked at anything remotely at the other end. Um, and I felt that was what really was missing from, from the George Best story, and that was what I really wanted to, to try and bring over. And that's really what, what attracted me to, to, to George. Now, are you, uh, by trade, though, are you a documentarian? Are you a filmmaker? Uh, uh, you know, give us some sense of your professional uh, uh, capabilities entering this. I guess, doc- I guess, documentary filmmaker. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, this this is my, I, I believe, this is my fifteenth feature documentary. I've been making docs uh, of, of sort of ninety minutes and over since two thousand and one. I started off in. Uh, making a film in North Korea about the North Korean soccer team from the World Cup in 66. I've predominantly used sports both as a background and, and a subject matter, um, you know, to try and tell bigger, bigger picture stories. Um, and, and George was, was certainly a, a way in to do that. Much, much I love him and much I love the archive that accompanies him. Um, I felt this was a, a deeper story to tell than just a, a soccer superstar. All right. So before we get into some of the, some of the subject matter, I, I really am interested sort of in the process by which you approached this. Right. So as a as a documentary uh, filmmaker, mm. uh, how do you approach a, 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 a arguably larger than life uh, figure in George Best and also at the same time try to tackle some of those uh, deficiencies, perhaps, that you may have seen or not seen in other uh, film and or works about his life? I think there were two things that that really attracted me, and that was uh, the archive and George's voice, uh, and they were the two things that I tried to 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 sort of get deeper in in terms of the approach to the film. Um, a lot of the archive, you know, you can go up on YouTube and you can look on any number of TV documentaries. It tended to be the same archive that was being used over and over and over again. And I felt that, that we needed to have the sort of the time and resources to to dig that out and to tell a a much bigger story of, of George than, than what had, had been before. So my my approach was to try and um, you know be as deep and as definitive as, as possible. And the other thing was was George's voice himself. And obviously, you know, he died 11 now, getting on for 12 years ago, um, and he'd done many, many, many interviews. Um, but I really wanted to to have his voice in there um, and for him to tell the story as, as best he could. So my um, my approach really was to try and trawl the archives to find both the you know audio only interviews or the actual sit down interviews that he would do, um, and and try and you know go through all those and try and pick the moments where he's a lot more open. Um, the, you know, the story is George Best was the sort of person that was always talking about himself at some point in his life. But what I found was that he was a lot more open about the deficiencies in his life when he'd just been through a dark period. So if he'd just been into rehab or if he just tried to, you know, make a second go of it in, in a marriage or something like that, he tended to be a lot more open and honest um, with his interviewer. Um, and that's something that we discovered as, as we did the research. Yeah, and and obviously we are referencing and we'll continue to reference. This is uh, the movie that Dan Gordon has uh, uh, put together. It is debuting on ESPN. Uh, depending on when you're listening to this, that's obviously uh, sometime later this week in the uh, on the the 20th of July, uh, but is also uh, uh, airing on a number of different other ESPN platforms, including Watch ESPN, which is always available on demand. Um, I, so uh, it is remarkable, and I don't want to give sort of anything away because it is it is a it is a very well done documentary just on its face. Even if you're not interested in the sport of soccer, 
uh, or maybe didn't even know who George Best was. I, I think it is that compelling. Um, but I'm I, the uh, it is remarkable to your point. Uh, some of the the footage and the audio that you use throughout the film uh, is quite uh, stark and honest and uh, surprisingly um, uh, available, I guess, or 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 incorporated. Uh, it is almost like George is writing the story for you in so many respects. And and I was flabbergasted by just to the point of how much honesty and and openness that he did provide through those recorded works. Yeah, and, and often it was a cry for help, but it wasn't recognized as such and it wasn't seen as such. Um, but we, we found, you know, so much of him where he's clearly telling a story that he's told a million times over and he's speaking as if he's really bored. Um, and those testimonies didn't make it into the cut. Um, but, but yeah, he, he, he is, the, the aim was um, from the beginning that he would be telling his story almost from the grave. And, and it, it, you, you always, you know, you have that as an idea or a fear, but you never know whether that will come off. Um, but we, he, again, I felt it was very important. We can, um, you know, we can get his closest and his nearest and dearest to tell us the story of George. Um, and they can be maybe critical of his, you know, his, his darker moments. But actually, if he's telling you himself in, a, in the most honest way, then that's much more powerful. So we were looking at, you know, at his interviews with that in mind for him to, to, to confirm what other people were saying and actually then replace other people with George in the film. See, I, I, from as an American soccer fan for a long time and, and, and long suffering, uh, and yes, we do exist and have existed for some time. <laughs> um, it is, uh, I, I suspect that uh, the way this film is received or has been received uh, uh, in, in Europe, right? It's been out for quite a while on the BBC and, 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 and other places, yeah. the film circuit, um, and how it's received in the U.S. as it sort of per, uh, percolates through the ESPN platforms uh, is going to be somewhat different, right? So from the American soccer fans perspective that is uh with a general understanding of george best playing in the north american soccer league it is uh widely eye-opening to sort of see his life and career uh legendary as it was at man u um and i think that's lost on a lot of american soccer fans but i do i suspect that the reverse is true when it comes to the european fans about his life and times in the united states is that fair to say? Yeah, that's the biggest reveal. Yeah, absolutely. For for the UK audience, there's two big reveals, I guess. For the UK audience, the big reveal is is the time, life and times in America, and actually how, you know, in trying to get away from it all and trying to get away from the press attention and trying to start a new life and then basically hanging out on a beach in LA, uh, it then spirals um, out of control by the time it gets to San Jose via Fort Lauderdale. So. Um, that's a real life now because we don't really, as a rule, that's not really the stuff that we see on on, on clip reels, George. Um, uh, and I guess uh, the other big reveal for a UK audience, because most of us believe that George West was this amazing player for such a legendary period of time, uh, the big reveal in the UK is that actually his career was over by 22 and he reached his peak and, and never, never got there again at the age of 22. Uh, and I think that's the... Uh, for people in the UK, we sort of come maybe with a bit more knowledge of, of George's overall career. But then once you see the film, you realize actually how little you did know. Well, I look, I think the film does an amazing job of, of uh, uh, at least enlightening the U.S. audience about what his life and legacy was even before he entertained the idea of coming to the United States to play for whatever reason. Um, and again, I, I don't want to give it away, but but there is a point in the film, uh, maybe about halfway through, where uh, the. Uh, the end, if you will, of the Man U side of the story uh, occurs and in, in, in almost in tone and in in vibrance and in sound, uh, this sort of white hot uh, 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 attraction called the North American Soccer League appears on the screen. And uh, do you want to tell your tell the audience a bit about uh, maybe if you can remember the uh, the clip that you used to kind of sort of bring in the NASL into the into this film? Yeah, and it's one of those where you couldn't get a better symbol of the NASL. Um, and it's an opening sort of type, title sequence for one of the, whichever um, TV station it is that's, uh, that's doing it. And, and they sort of, it's a big, it's a graphic, it's sort of a big sort of lion type kicking a football. And, and it's like introducing NASL, well, championship soccer or something, which even now to an English person sounds ridiculous because we're used to, 
you know, football, soccer being, you know, covered in a, in a much more serious way. And, and the whole thing that we, you know, I grew up knowing of the NASL, um, but also it was a, a big thing that we used to make fun of because, you know, they had, they had, you know, what we would call extra time, you call overtime. They had penalty shootouts from the 35 yard line. Uh, they had all the razzmatazz. They had teams coming out with dry ice, all that kind of thing that was actually, I mean, a lot of it actually has been sort of used since, but we saw it as, as entertainment and we never saw football as entertainment. It was sort of life and death. Um, and, and you get this big sort of explosion into the film of, of uh, an introduction to George's new way of life and what, he saw actually quite refreshing um, at the beginning, certainly. Um, different way of life. He's on the beach. He's sort of, the fans love him, but the press don't bother him. But of course, then his demons take over and, and you know, that, that sort of love, love affair he has with America quickly goes downhill. Uh, well, before we get into a couple of, uh, of elements of that story, uh, I, I also uh, uh, was paid great diligence to the end uh, credits when you uh, had some various thanks to various folks. Um, and uh, I noticed that uh, uh, Dave Brett Wasser was uh, was mentioned, who in the United States in in soccer circles is uh, sort of known as the king of uh, old uh, soccer video. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really curious as to how you found some of that that's that footage and and sort of how did you uh, think about incorporating it in uh, that TVS? I, I mean, uh, some of it. We yeah. I wanted as much as we can because obviously that's the least seen. Certainly over here, it's the least seen stuff. Um, and some of it was with Dave, some of it was with local archives. We found a couple of guys, um, I think they the Wolfson Archive in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Some of the stuff the BBC recorded in the 70s and then put it back in their vault um, hasn't been seen since. So there was a lot of, of various archives worldwide. Um, and to me, just, just seeing all this stuff is brilliant. Uh, but also, you know, the, 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 you know, to extend that even further back into the early 60s, there's a lot of stuff of George in a you know, really looking like a raw, skinny, you know, barely 19-year-old player. And, you know, we have the, the very famous Saturday night, um, you know, highlights program on the BBC called Match of the Day. And this was, you know, one, two, maybe three games a week would be covered uh, and George would be covered, but it was you know, shot on the day, broadcast at night, and then put back into the cans and hasn't been seen since. And we were able to get them out of the, you know, deep storage of the BBC uh, and get them up there. So I was fascinated by this football archive that had never been seen before or, or pretty much since. And the same, obviously, for for the NASL, to, to see any, even though the quality is abysmal in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the, the sort of what we used now with, you know, games being recorded in 4k and 8k but it's actually seeing that what we see is history um and, and being able to sort of i mean for us we're lucky enough in the edit to see it over and over again um but it's just gorgeous it's absolutely gorgeous to watch and some of it's hilarious you know some of the quality or lack thereof um is great to watch but also just just seeing a moment in time and real you know th this is you know the nasl was an uh, uh, you know um Ray Hudson says it in, in the, the film. It, it's like, um, you know, this is a moment that will never be repeated, you know, can never be repeated. All these world stars coming at once for this sort of almost Harlem Globetrotter-esque type football teams um, with some homegrown talent, with massive crowds, with huge enthusiasm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge thing in football history, even though we mocked it back then as English people. Um, I know speaking to all the football players that played out there at that time, who were top, top players in the English leagues, they preferred their time out there, out in America, because the sun shone, the crowds were great, the enthusiasm was massive. And by comparison, England was, was awful, absolutely awful to play in. Decrepit stadiums, you know, hooliganism all the time, um, you know, teams not being that good. And, and they went to America and sort of almost threw their shackles off and enjoyed it. And that's what attracted George at the beginning was to be able to, you know, to literally throw off his shackles and enjoy his football again. Well, I, I think it's also interesting in this moment in time in, in the in the sport of American soccer. I mean, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the ma with Major League Soccer here in the United States mm. is about 20 plus years on. Uh, it is still not nearly the level of the English Premier League or any of the great European leagues, of course. But. Um, you know, the, the uh, substantial growth and roots and stadia and and television coverage, it's it's 
Uh, you couldn't even imagine, even in the heady days of the North American Soccer League, where this sport is going. And it, interestingly, in the U.S., we are finding quite a bit of uh, by whole cloth name and uh, and logos, uh, but also just in general pieces, uh, almost a craving in some respects of some of the earlier days of the old North American Soccer League from a heritage perspective, right? Limited as it might be in this country. So this story, you know, George Best was a, uh, a, you know, a major component of three teams in, you know, a number of years in this North American Soccer League. And and it's interesting, this this sort of younger generation who are picking up the sport in the United States and following it sort of rapidly, uh, almost don't even recognize that there was this sort of history uh, thin as it might be prior to the existence of major league soccer, which is interesting to me. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think when they discover all that, they'll love it and they'll go and get all the old merchandise and they'll go and get their, you know, the retro t-shirts and stuff. And, you know, Fort Lauderdale shirt, the red and, uh, red and yellow hoop shirts with number three on it and best on the back. You know, I, I think people then do begin to, to get that there was a history and a, a time before now. I mean, I, I was, um, in my former life, I was a soccer coach. I came out to America in 94 uh, during the World Cup, and I, I coached in uh, in Massachusetts for the summer, and um, you know there wasn't there was a World Cup going on, there wasn't really a huge understanding of the game, there wasn't even a league. And this is only 1994, so in terms of progression, America has made huge, huge progress. But I think once you get that establishment, people do crave history, and they do want to know more. And so you know, again, old players that I've interviewed have said, you know, they, there are enough people who remember the old days, uh, that they're quite famous when they go back. And, and I think that's great that the, that the clubs, I mean, obviously some clubs don't exist anymore, but the clubs that, that do, or they have, you know, they have a forerunner, if you like, and do celebrate the heritage. It's important and it is part of the football. I mean, I'm, you know, I support Sheffield Wednesday in England. We're 150 years old in September and there's going to be a massive, um, you know, a, a massive celebration of that 150 years. But when I started, um, you know, whatever, nearly... 40 odd years ago watching my dad was telling me the players that he loved growing up and the ones that his dad loved growing up before him. So I knew all the history of the football team and that's what, that's what pins you through life. And now my daughters are fourth generation and they've got their heroes and that gets passed on. You know, in England, we're all very famous. You, you don't choose your religion. It's handed to you. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in Manchester, all my friends are Man United. I'm Sheffield Wednesday. Um, but it's because of that history that I've been able to sort of be taught, cling to and pass on. And it's huge. And I think it'll be big in America as well. That That is what eventually you know, people people love the here and now, but actually they, they do love to, to have an identity of sorts. And um, so I think what, what American, what the league has done in America is actually at least establish itself and begin to get stories of rivalries and big games and stuff like that. And then over the years, you'll start to get people, you know, again, Harking back to what we all think of the good old days. So I suspect the uh, the uh, American uh, days of George's life uh, was probably the hardest to sort of construct or, or at least piece together or even formulate the, the, the narrative. But maybe you could give our audience a bit of an understanding of how you approached that that particular part of his life. How did you approach the L.A. Aztecs and the, uh, you know, the movement from team to team and, and his somewhat downward spiral? How did you construct the narrative and approach it from a uh, from a documentary point of view? Uh, well, the, to tell the, the LA part, the LA part of the story from a documentary perspective was actually quite easy to approach, and um, because um, you know he left Man United, he quit for good. He'd already tried to quit once before, but he, he came back. He was he was fat. He couldn't kick a ball. And again, in a football perspective, you cannot believe that only five years earlier. This has been a man at the absolute peak of his career. Now he can barely kick a football. Um, but then he, he sort of has a little bit of time out. And then before we know it, he's in America uh, and playing for, for L.A. Um, you know, in the Coliseum, in this world famous stadium. Um, uh, you know, Elton John is a co-owner. So that sort of brings the glamour. Although, it's again, it's a hilarious moment of archive to see Elton John in 1976 with the LAPD women's motorcycle team, you know, display team in the background. Um, but what was then difficult um, in terms of constructing a narrative is um, the season in America only lasted a few months. And so what people would do was to go out at the end of the English season, play a little bit, which also then fed into the English season and they sort of overlapped. So actually what George was doing was playing for 
um, playing for LA, playing for Fort Lauderdale, playing for San Jose. But in the meantime, he was also doing minimal contracts, two, three, six month contracts with other teams. Um, and what was happening was he was signing for these teams. It was he was great, you know. In, in England, we call it putting bums on seats. It's just you know, he's a star attraction. He doubles and trebles uh, the attendances, which I always thought was an apocryphal story. But then we looked into the statistics, and he was, you know, he would minimum double, normally treble the average gate. Um, and then something would flip in his life, and it would all go wrong. So what we tried to do was to show this sort of nomadic existence that he had. And he was going between America and, and the UK. I mean, some of it was in London, some of it was in Scotland. Um, but he was sort of trying to invent himself or reinvent himself as an entertainer. Um, but it was almost like the circus coming to town then, by, by that stage. And one of the, the key contributors, a, a journalist called Hugh McIlvany, who's just a brilliant writer, would say, you know, occasionally you'd get, you know, really great moments of the, of the old George, but he just looked like a, a bad impersonator of George Best. And I think that's when you realise how far he's fallen, how far his star has fallen. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it, it, it was a very difficult thing to try and get, you know, focused on the US story. And But I think it's very symptomatic of, of George, that the US side of his story is very symptomatic. It starts brilliantly He's fresh, he looks lean, he looks amazing in great shape. Football goes well, but then he flips. And then by the end in San Jose, he's, he's drinking really, really heavily. And by really heavily, you know, he talks of like a 22-day session. Um, and, you know, I, I can't even begin to imagine how that plays itself out. Um, but yeah, so all the things that he went out to America for, the, the lifestyle, the glamour, the money, the crowns, all that by the end had gone. And this is obviously the demise of the NASL is mirrored in the demise of George Best. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com dot com slash good seats and now back to our conversation it seems to me that a lot of uh, his u.s uh, story certainly begins uh and is uh pretty substantial with uh his wife angie uh who whose mm-hmm. maiden name was dangerfield correct uh uh no and uh Angie's sister is Lindy Dangerfield, who's married to Chris Dangerfield, who was his uh, fellow player at San Jose. So uh, Angie, uh, so basically George and George, there was George and Andy, uh, sorry, George G and uh, Lindy and Chris. So they kind of formed a little foursome. Sure, but it's but it's clear that, and as and again, I don't want to give too much away of this film, but but the 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 the. Uh, the narration, shall we say, or the storytelling of Angie, I think, is uh, uh, crucial to this uh, this portion of of George's uh, career. And and 
even at the very beginning of the film. Yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, it is. And, and uh, the opening of the film, and uh, I'll definitely not give the game away then, um, but the opening of the film is, is very much one of those moments where if you've tuned in to watch a film about George Best, you might expect um, a great highlights reel of all these brilliant goals. And actually what you do get is this very, very different opening where you're wondering what sort of film you're watching. But the delivery of, of Angie on that opening tells you exactly the sort of film you're going to be watching. Um, and then when she comes on the scene... Um, you know, at the beginning, she's, they're perfect for each other and they're, they're looking at an amazing couple together and she's clearly madly in love with him um, and then falls into the trap of kind of wanting to, to mother him. Um, and then, you know, there, there's a, yeah, again, it's a, a classic downhill story after that. Um, a couple of other things. So uh, it's it, it seems to me based on, um, you know, by, by all accounts and, and I, I, amazing some footage that you got about uh, from uh, his days of opening a bar. Right. The ultimate worst thing you could ever do being a an admitted or not even admitted or recovering or not even recovering alcoholic, uh, which arguably, you know, George was was that and more. Um, were you incredulous once you not only understood that part of the story, but then were able to find footage and or commentary around that idea? And anybody would think that would be reasonably close to a good idea for him. Well, I knew I knew of the bar, um, you know, and it, it was quite you know, growing up. It's quite famous. If you're ever in L.A., go and see Bestie's Bar. You know, it's it's that. Uh, but I think no one really understood you know, what a bad idea it was. But he was, I mean, the, the um, Bobby McLinden, who co-owned the bar with him and he was his kind of enforcer on the pitch at playing for LA Aztecs, you know, he also said he, he was he was the bar's best customer by a long way. But also he was several other bars in the area's best customer. He didn't just restrict himself to his own bar. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you couldn't think it was a worse idea. And in the film, you've already got an understanding of his love of, of socializing and love of drink and love of women and how that's beginning to eat away at him. And then you get the fact that they've opened a bar and you just, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a classic eyes rolling moment. It, it just seems, though, that that on the pitch, though, he seemed to somehow and you look at the statistics and, and you know, I, and I, I did a little bit of, of digging that he somehow on many occasions, not all, of course, uh, summoned, up, summoned up the either natural raw talent or uh, the muscle memory or whatever uh, to, to make things happen. I, and here's a case in point. So in 78, when he was with the Aztecs for his now third summer season. Right. And obviously it was famously and you, you mentioned it in the film. Uh, they got tired of his antics and, and his inability to show up for practice and whatnot. And they traded him literally in midseason uh, to the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. And uh, by my uh, research, that happened on, and, and this is not on the quiz, Dan, so, 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 so don't worry about mm. it. Um, on June 20th, 1978, uh, was his last game with the Aztecs. Uh, and that was a, a defeat at um, Washington Diplomats. Uh, they lost 4-0, uh, uh, okay? And then literally four days later, he suits up for Fort Lauderdale at Fort Lauderdale, where the Cosmos come to play. This is on June 24th, four days later. Um, they lose five to three, but Best scores two goals. Right. Yeah. And and, yeah. and that, that was after a, I don't know, a, maybe a, a three months or so of of arguably not producing very well for the Aztecs. So there's something yeah. in him that that it, it's it's incredible. I mean, it's very amazing to me yeah. to how he could play on the field and yet not uh, off of it. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he's almost certainly finished that game against Washington, or at Washington, I think, and then just got on a plane to Fort Lauderdale and turned up in his kit, been given some stuff, and yeah, off he goes. And, and I mean, he was able to do that, and the, the problem that he had was that he then over relied on being able to do that, um, and some days just couldn't do that, and then he would get frustrated, and then he'd get angry with himself for you know, not, not being able to turn it on like he used to. And the, I think his biggest problem um, in that respect was that he was so naturally gifted so that when he was a youth player and a young player, he just went out and did it. He had no idea, you know, how he was doing what he was doing. He just did it. Uh, and I think as age creeps up with you and, and you know, the, the speed goes and your awareness goes, he wasn't able to produce it quite as often. Um, and, you know, the NASL wasn't, you know, it wasn't 11 world-class World Cup winning players. It, it wasn't, you know, terrible, but there, there were enough players that weren't too good that he could get away with it. Um, but it is, it's, it, it, his NASL career is full, absolutely full of moments like that. 
where he just get you know gets traded, gets on a plane, plays to a completely different team in a different stadium. Never spoken to any of his players before, and he scores two goals. Well, and again, I also don't want to spoil this, but uh, it's too too good not to mention. Speaking of one of those moments, it's a seminal one uh, near the tail end of his uh, his his time in San Jose, which was his last uh, official stop in the North American Soccer League. Uh, do you want to? Maybe uh, talk a bit about the uh, the clip that yeah, you used. And the, the irony, again, of, of that particular goal, I mean, this is one of the greatest goals. I mean, it is one of the greatest goals you'll ever see. And um, But it, it then wins the ironically titled Budweiser goal of the year. You know, it, it couldn't have just been a regular drink. It had to be a, an alcoholic drink. Um, but he he takes on seven or eight players um, in, in one move and scores a goal. But it's not just that. It's basically he... They're playing, it's actually he's at San Jose, they're playing Fort Lauderdale at San Jose. Um, and Fort Lauderdale score a goal, which by all accounts should have been ruled out for offside. He's absolutely furious with the referee and the referee books him yellow card. And then in those days, the yellow card, you, had, you really had to earn a yellow card before you got one. Um, and he, he gets the ball pretty much from kickoff and then skips around seven or eight players, takes you know one or two of them on twice, and then fires this amazing goal in. And, and his, from, from everything that I was told, his one regret, always looking back, was that that wasn't a goal for Man United at Liverpool. That would have been his, or, or his home end, the Stratford end at Man United. That was his only regret of that particular goal. If he could have scored that goal there, rather than, rather than um, in San Jose. However, at any level, you know, if I was playing in my pub league and I was able to do that next week, you will still be hearing about it when I'm in my 70s. It's an, you know, it's an exceptional um, display of skill because uh, you know, to do it at any level is amazing. Um, but it is it's just one of those goals and you kind of realise that yes, he does have it and yes, he can turn it on and yes, he still does have this little moment you know, genius here and there, but then you still end up as a, certainly as a football fan and I think most people watching the film have thought this it's a real like, oh, what if, if only, you know, if only he'd done this or that or the other, he, you know, he could have done this. He could, I mean, really, in 1978, 79, he should still be doing this in England for Man United. He really ought to be. He's only, he's only 32, 33 years old. He should still be playing at the very, very top. But of course, he's not. So that goal was uh, July 22nd, 1981, and it's available widely on YouTube, but uh, it's worth seeing that. Uh, oh, it was 81, you're right, because the other thing as well that year was that's the year before the World Cup in 82, and there was uh, Northern Ireland qualified, well, one of the very, very few occasions that they qualified for the World Cup, and there was a massive discussion um, nationally in the UK, but particularly in Northern, Northern Ireland, about whether they were going to recall George Best for the World Cup, because all these great players the world over, whether it was Cruyff or Pele or Beckenbauer or whoever, were all amazing players, but they also played at hand won the World Cup. Um, but Best never even played in the World Cup, and it was always considered this big question mark over his career that, well, we've never seen him at World Cup, so he can't be considered one of the world's greatest. And then the 82 World Cup was coming. He scores this amazing goal. Um, but then, as, as you know, we find out in the film, he, he then, off the back of winning this, goal of the season award he goes off on a 22 day drinking session and the Northern Ireland team manager just decided that it just wasn't worth the distraction the inevitable media distraction that would accompany George Best going to the World Cup and when you realise that you don't go to the World Cup not because of your ability but because of the baggage you bring to the situation you realise how far he's fallen so it's, it's, um, it's a real bittersweet moment really it's a great demonstration of his skill but it's also a demonstration of self-destruct button. Well, he certainly was self-aware. And again, you, you uh, elegantly use his own words uh, to, uh, you know, emboldened and forward uh, the narrative. Uh, he, he basically admitted uh, in one part of your film where he said by the time he got to San Jose, he noticed that all the best players were leaving. Right. And obviously the you could hear sort of more of the, the, the depressive sort of uh, 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 couching of, of the situation. And it also seemed too. I mean, Angie comes in and says that, you know, it, it seems that San Jose, perhaps of any of his stops in the NASL, truly went out of their way to try to make him uh, a better and whole person beyond just being a player on the pitch. Right. To, to, the, to the extent of 
he's got problems and and we we got to figure out ways to be of help on a on a on a more uh holistic basis um is that fair yeah. to say yeah that is and it it, it was more there was a, an understanding of a duty of care uh more at uh at san jose i think fort Lauderdale tried to help him but really didn't know how and didn't have the tools um san jose at the time was owned by milan Mandaric, who coincidentally later owned my team chef wednesday um but uh, you know milan Mandaric was another father figure for george uh, it's not in the film but he he basically took him under his wing uh and and tried to to if not get him fixed at least put him in the right place to try to get him fixed um and i mean he um Callum Best, George's son, his, his middle name's Milan, after Mandarich, uh, the owner at San Jose. Um, so there was this, this understanding, and, and I, think, I think that the U.S. sports franchise were a lot more equipped generally to, to deal with these kinds of issues. It's only in the last 10 years or so that, that the U.K. clubs, the Premier League clubs, and, and, and other sports have actually understood uh, the mental health issues around their, their stars. So... I think he was quite ahead of the curve, Mandaric, in terms of how he dealt with best. Um, but yeah, he, he does he, he does certainly uh, you know sort of pay tribute to him in the film. And Milan Mandaric, somebody definitely we'd like to get on on this program at some point because uh, uh, for those uh, soccer fans uh, with deep understanding and knowledge of the history of the game, uh, know that uh, Mandaric was uh, one of the early and and often unsung pioneers of uh, of the old North American Soccer League, and even in in the days prior to the NASL's uh, uh, creation. Um, a couple of quick things before we, we run, Dan, and I, I do want to uh, thank you again for your time. This has been fantastic so far. Um, I notice a few uh, other names uh, mentioned in the thanks of the film, uh, one of which that stood out to me, one of whom stood out to me was uh, was Rodney Marsh. And and I think Rodney, uh, arguably, before Best came over to the United States, was probably uh, a figure that was, uh, uh, you know, probably uh, a... a uh, partner in crime, so to speak, I guess, when uh, when Best was still playing on, on the uh, in, in the UK. Um, was Rodney uh, a part of your original narrative uh, for his uh, stateside exploits or, um, you know, obviously. Ray yeah, Hudson he, he was. Awkward. He was. And the unfortunate thing is, and this is the, the problem of sort of filming on different continents. Uh, we had an interview lined up with him in London. He had a family issue on the day of the interview. Couldn't make it. Was getting on the plane the following day to Tampa. Uh, we weren't in Tampa at that time. Then when we came over Tampa, he had had to come back to the UK. And then as soon as we came back to the UK, he was back over in Tampa again. And we never were anywhere near each other. We always thought we would get an interview with Rodney um, at some point. But in the end, I, I kind of felt that actually the film, not that it doesn't need him, because I think he's, he's great. I, I knew both Rodney and George when we were all working at Sky Sports together. So the, in terms of getting the interview, it wouldn't have been a problem. Um, but he certainly knew him... Um, knew him best and, and, and fairly closest, I think, as well. Um, and and it, was a, it was a relationship they had together. They had a very similar attitude to how to play the game, how to enjoy the game, how to have fun. If you're a defender, it, they must have been hell to play with on the same team because they were too busy having a laugh and trying to take on other players. Um, but I suspect if you're a fan of any team that either of them ever played for, they're the ones that you'll remember. You know, you remember watching. There's a very famous um, game uh, in in England when uh, when Fulham play Hereford. And it, it happened to be covered by the the UK TV cameras. Uh, and you know, one George Best tackles Rodney Marsh during the game. They're on the same team, and it's a big sort of entertainment game. I remember that um, George Best is on the Fulham team. I remember Rodney Marsh on the football team. The World Cup winning captain England, Bobby Moore, is on the team. I don't know any of the other players on that on that eleven. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about, you know, George and Rodney. You you knew that they were playing. You didn't really know any other players on the pitch. Well, Rod- Rodney's also on our short list and obviously lots of uh, amazing stories from his <laughs> Tampa Bay days, too. So maybe we'll get a couple of uh, uh, trade a couple of notes and get a yeah, few and questions. He, in. he did the last interview with George. You know, he, he was on George was on his talk show just two months before he dies, which is in the in the film. And it's a very, very sad. You know, I've, I've seen the full interview. Uh, and especially when you know what's going to happen. It was a sad interview anyway, because you'd seen, you saw how ill he looked. Um, you know, he's got a failing liver and he, he, his breathing's awful and, and he's trying to sort of be upbeat. Uh, and loads of callers phone in to tell, you know, great George Best stories or great, great moments of, you know, seeing him play. But you've, you see this guy 
who looks like in his 70s, but he's actually only 59. And we don't know, but he only has two months to live. It, it's a very, very sad final interview. That's it. That is tragic. Um, all right. One last person. I want to throw a name at you. Um, and obviously lots of pictures and a lot of uh, cross promotional things happened uh, during both of their time in the NASL. And of course, uh, has been elusive for other documentarians trying to tell the stories of the 70s and 80s here in the United States. And that's Pelé. Uh, was he a pursuit of yours mm -hmm. for this film? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we actually interviewed him, but um, I may be one of the few people that dropped him. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we interviewed him when he was at Cosmos, and, and I mean, admittedly, he wasn't very well. He had just been in hospital. Um, but he, you know, he, he's very famous for describing George as the, you know, the best player in the world. Um, and, you know, it's in, it's in his books, it's in George's books. It's, it's all, we sat down for an interview with, with Pelé and, he quantified that, that he was the best player in the world at a particular time in his position alongside Garincha, which doesn't quite do it for me in terms of filmmaking. Um, but he, he's, his big thing was more that he didn't actually, he never played with him, he only ever played against him. Um, you know, and he was mesmerized by the skill. He, he felt that, that George was a very South American type football player he, he would have been uh you know in the brazilian team he would have been in the argentinian team he never really came across as a, a british type of player because of his flair um but yeah he he was um he, he did give us um give us his time it's not the first time i've interviewed him but he did give us his time uh and for free as well um it was to i think they were promoting uh one of the cosmos games um the current team um this is probably two two years ago, something like that. Um, but yeah, we, we, we just didn't put him in. But again, because you do all these interviews and in spite of the name that you've interviewed, if it doesn't fit the narrative that you're trying, of a film you're trying to make and it becomes a distraction, it doesn't end up going in a film. So unfortunately, I ended up dropping Pelé, who is, who is my hero, I have to add as well. When I was growing up, he was the, the player that I most looked up to no, in I... terms of you know, watching, watching all footage and stuff. So it was always my ambition to, to meet him and interview him. And I have, I have managed to do it twice, but, um, but yeah, he didn't make it into that film, I'm afraid. Well, look, I, I, I think that most of our audience don't necessarily fully understand how complex uh, making a documentary film, especially with, uh, you know, uh, gravitas and, and, and stories that have to be told in only a short period of time. And, and uh, you know, you can't you can't do seven hour uh, documentaries uh, without, uh, you know, having leave. It's just impossible. And, um, you know, decisions need to be made. Um, OK, so last question, I, Dan. I, and again, thank you so much for, for being part of this conversation. Uh, pleasure. I, I'm, pleasure. I'm really curious to hear uh, what you might have learned about uh, the man as well as the player, George Best, in this uh, journey of making this film that perhaps you didn't know about before. Uh, do you think everything was kind of known out there or did you discover some some hidden truths there that uh, were uh, new to you in this process? No, I think I think very little of it was truly known before, and, and I guess this is the first time that it's all been put together in, into one into one film. Um, I, I think I I really came to understand in terms of the playing side just how early his career truly finished, which was at the age of twenty two, at the height of his career, and um, scoring what becomes the winning goal, effectively the winning goal in the European Cup final. Um, and he's only 22 years old and he's in the shower after the game and he realises that it's probably never going to get as good as this ever again um, and how is he going to deal with it um, I, and I think very few people know that story you know, even in the UK where we think we know everything um, <laughs> we think we know everything generally <laughs> but in terms of, um, in terms of George Best that's, that's kind of the story that we think we know and we, we don't know we, we don't realise just how bad it was for him the other thing I guess um, I, I began to understand um, was that this was also a film about an, an addiction and, and in the beginning George is addicted, totally addicted to football and whilst you think that was great, what a great thing to be addicted to, as the film unfolds you realise that actually addiction is a really big problem full stop and when he can't replace the high of playing football, of performing in front of 60, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 people, when he can't replace that high, he goes searching for it in other ways. And it begins with women and it then continues into alcohol. And then he, he can just never replace that high ever again. Um, and that's really what I learned. You know, I think more than anything was, was just how that spiral began 
and it's very innocent at the beginning, and then it just becomes really, really dark by the end. And then when you know when you see, uh, you know, the final picture of him, you know, and he's on his deathbed, and and then you reflect a really, really sad and poignant moment as it should be in the film, but you reflect on this this young, thin, fresh-faced kid from Belfast versus what he became. Uh, and then you're very conflicted about you know the career and, and the time in between. Um, so yeah, it's certainly no happy ending. Um, but I think you get a, overall you get a much bigger picture of, of the, the man and the football around the man. Um, and you, you know you're left with your own impressions. No, and I, I think um, his uh, his second wife Alex uh, in the film mentions it and says it says it well. It's it's uh, something along the lines of remember the football, and um, yes, clearly a genius on the field. And, and- and- but, but yeah, but also um, the first wife then says that was the phrase he used to try and deflect from what he had become. And then you realize, yeah, you know, probably right. But ultimately, we do remember only the football. Um, you know, if you, if you ask anyone in the UK about George Best, they'll still, by and large, they'll still talk about the football. Okay, the film is called George Best, All By Himself. Uh, ESPN Films 30 for 30. It is uh, debuting on ESPN, the Mothership channel here in the United States, uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, the 20th of July. Depending on when you're hearing this, you will also uh, note that uh, it will be on a number of different ESPN channels, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN Classic, you name it. Uh, And of course, if uh, you are a subscriber to ESPN uh, on cable television, you have access to the Watch ESPN platform where it is available on demand. Again, it's George Best all by himself. And our guest for almost an hour uh, and generously so has been the uh, director and the creator of the film, Dan Gordon, uh, who I thank tremendously for, uh, for for taking time out to explain to a U.S. based audience uh, some of the magic of George Best, the man and uh, the making of the film, which is itself magic. And I highly recommend that's very complimentary. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it, it comes only from uh, the quality uh, I, in my little uh, world of, of, of judgment. Uh, it is, it's the first five minutes, even if you're not a fan of soccer or didn't even know who George Best was, will grip you. And I, get, I dare you to not watch the entire thing after seeing that first five minutes. Yeah. And, and that's I mean, you know, it was very deliberate to make that a very, very different type of film. And, and the thing that I've always tried to do in, in documentaries I've made, but they're all predominantly of a sports theme and three of them now. And this is my third 30 for 30. Um, you know, they're all they're all on the surface. Do you think they're a sports film, but actually tell a much, much bigger story? I, 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 again, highly recommended. And I uh, thank you, Dan, for uh, your time. And I, I wish you great success with it and uh, other projects to come. We look forward to hopefully staying in touch. Thank you very much. Take care now. Cheers. OK, there it is. This is our uh, great conversation with uh, with uh, Dan Gordon. Uh, the movie, again, is called George Best, all by himself. Uh, it is an ESPN Films 30 for 30 presentation. Uh, it is uh, available uh, on the Watch ESPN platform. Uh, so if you're a subscriber to ESPN, uh, the broadband connection, you should have no trouble finding and uh, watching on demand uh, the film George Best all by himself. Uh, look to as well, depending on when you're listening to this uh, episode for uh, various re-airings uh, in linear form on uh, the ESPN family of networks as well. But uh, you can indeed watch it now on the Watch ESPN uh, app. Uh, where you can also see uh, a few of Dan's previous uh, works. Uh, He has done two, as he mentioned, previous uh, ESPN Films 30 for 30s, uh, one from 2012 called 9.79, which is the story of the 1988 Olympics uh, 100-meter dash finals between Ben Johnson and Carl Lewis and all the drama that surrounded that. Uh, That was from 2012. And in 2014, uh, Dan Gordon uh, produced and directed and created uh, one of uh, 30 for 30's soccer stories called Hillsboro, which is uh, the uh, tragic story and the uh, aftermath of the, uh, the, the tragedy that happened uh, in Hillsboro at the stadium there uh, in April of 1989. Um, I believe both of those are available for viewing on the Watch ESPN platform as well as uh, a purchase. Uh, we'll have a link to uh, those, uh, those movies, uh, which are purchasable. Uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Last note, Dan also uh, uh, created uh, a a documentary back in 2002, uh, not part of the ESPN Films uh, 30 for 30 series, but uh, uh, well worth seeking out uh, by itself. Uh, It is a story of the North Korean 1966 World Cup soccer team. Uh, The movie is called The Game of Their Lives, The Game of Their Lives. 
Um, it came out in 20, oh, 2002, thank you. Uh, and um, uh, that is a dramatic story about the sort of uh, uh, phenomenon that was the North Korean soccer team during that tournament and uh, the virtual disappearance of, of them uh, and uh, what became of them uh, after the fact. So these are all good things uh, from Dan Gordon worth pursuing, uh, but uh, we thank him tremendously for uh, engaging us in, uh, in the chat about his current film and the life of George Best. Uh, here on this little podcast. So thank you again, everybody, for uh, for listening. Uh, we are encouraged and uh, and enthused by your uh, your reactions and your uh, your interactions with us on social media and on the website and email and stuff. Keep it coming. More good stuff ahead. Thanks for listening. I'm Tim Hanlon, and you are who you are, and please don't ever change. We, uh, we appreciate your listenership, and we'll talk to you again soon here on The Big Show. Bye-bye.